Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dwayne McGrody. I am a regional power expert application engineer for the Gulf region. So I cover Texas and all the surrounding states. Uh, I've been with Eaton for about 18 years. 10 of those years, I was a product manager for meters. And the last eight years, I've been located here in the Gulf region, supporting our sales offices, uh, supporting consulting engineers, uh, work with each one of our sales offices if they want to set up lunch and learns and things like that. Today, I'm going to be talking about power monitoring and how it pertains to energy codes. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about the entire energy code, uh, just very specific sections of it that pertain uh, to the metering portion of it. So today's agenda, I'm just going to start off with the basics of metering, uh, touch on the energy codes, at least from my experience, what I've seen uh, in, in this region, and talk about how we, how we solve addressing some of these energy codes with some of the products that we have. And then how does all this stuff communicate and come together to kind of meet and address these energy codes? So basics of metering starting off, you really need two measurements. You need your current uh, and you need your voltage. Starting with current, there's a variety of different ways to do that. The meter itself cannot take the amperage of a specific switchboard or panel board, uh, which is typically 400 amps, 1200 amps, 2000 amps, whatever it is. We have to step that down to typically a, 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 another signal that the meter will accept. Uh, in the marketplace, typically five amps has been the secondary signal that we've seen. Uh, as time went on and as new products came out, 333 millivolt has kind of been a new standard that's come out. Accuracies are important. Uh, with the five amp CTs, you typically get down to 0.3 amps or 0.3% accuracy. Uh, with the 333 millivolts, they're down to 0.5%. One of the advantages of the, point, uh, the 333 millivolt is you don't need a CT shorting block. Uh, they can go directly to the meter without having to do that. When it comes to current, and you're using these current sensors, there's some important things you have to uh, watch out for when you're using these. Uh, the current sensors have two leads coming out of them, a plus and a minus. And in the meter itself that they're going to connect to, there's a plus and a minus. Who can tell me what would happen if I mixed a plus and minus on the meter? Utility company pays you. Utility company pays you, exactly. <laughs> So essentially, it's starting to monitor negative energy usage, which if you're using these for energy codes or if you're using these to do some cost allocation, that's a big deal. Uh, there's another marking on the current sensor that has a little arrow. The arrow says, uh, typically says towards the load. What happens if you put the CT pointing towards the source? Yeah, again, the, the utility company pays you. So you'll get a negative reading as well. So if you just happen to get the leads wrong and the orientation of the CT wrong, it'll actually work right. So um, that's just something to be con uh, considered with. The other thing you need to be pay attention to is a lot of these CTs and current sensors look the same. So a five amp CT versus a 333 millivolt CT look different. And I know that I've worked on some projects where we would ship out the meter and the CTs would show up and be in a big box and some would be 333 millivolt types, some would be five amp, and even in some of the same signal types, one could be a 30 amp CT, some, one other one could be a 100 amp CT, but they look exactly the same. So when these are being installed in the field, it's very important that those things are taken into consideration. I'm gonna bring that up, the reason I'm bringing that up is we have solutions to address that, and as I go through, I'll talk about that. The other main uh, part is voltage. Voltage is fairly simple. Uh, all of our meters are typically, a lot of the meters in the marketplace are ready for 600 volts or less. Anything above 600 volts, you're gonna have to put some kind of transformer to step it down so it takes a 600 volts. So typically a 208 or 480 can go directly into the meter. Uh, there's also a control power aspect of the meter as well. Uh, some of those can go up to 415 volts. Some of them can go up to like say 240 and that's it. And in those cases, you have to use a control power transformer to step that down. If these are installed in the factory, you don't have to worry about that. They're just going to have all the correct wiring and voltage and things like that uh, already in there. All right, so when it comes to uh, using these meters, there's usually two categories that you're wanting. One is the energy and the power, and the other is the power quality. For today's discussion, I'm going to focus on the energy and the power. Um, usually the energy and power is actually the work that's being done by the meter. 
So simplified, when it comes to energy, this is similar to at your home where you have a meter outside the home, it's monitoring the amount of energy you're using. So if you think about a 100 watt bulb used for one hour, that's a one watt hour. If you have 10 of those 100 watt bulbs, that's one kilowatt. Use that for an hour, it's one kilowatt hour. Use it for an entire day, that's 24 kilowatt hours. That is a constantly accumulating value. Now, when it comes to the energy codes, that's one parameter the very interesting too. What is the amount of energy that's being used or the watt hours? The second component is power demand. So power demand is usually specified over a period of time, usually a 15 minute window is very common, that the utility is basically going to provide enough power to that facility. Now, a facility has to decide uh, when it's going to start things up in the morning, say, let's just take an example of a facility that starts at 8 a.m. and they turn on all their chillers, they turn on all their lights, and within that 15 minutes, they turn everything on. Now, if they do that, that demand is going to be pretty high, you know, within that 15 minutes. And that's how much power that utility has to provide to that specific customer. And there's a separate charge, typically in a commercial environment, on the bill, that'll say demand charge, and it'll be like so many cents per kilowatts. And sometimes that demand charge can be more uh, than the kilowatt hour charge for the entire month. So it's very important to pay attention to that specific charge and uh, power so that you can manage it and maybe start things, you know, maybe delay over that 15 minute window. And each utility is gonna have a different window. It might be a 30 minute window, it might be a one hour window, just depending on the utility. So in talking about what the utility has to provide, another uh, thing that the power or the utility it provides is what they call uh, VA or the volts times the amps. So if a facility was all electric use, you know, like electric heaters, uh, it would basically the VA that it's supplying would equal to the watts or the work being done at the facility because it would all come out as heat. But if I have a facility that has a lot of motors, uh, some of the motors are actually doing some work by turning, but the, some of the motors are also generating heat, which is actually wasted. So the VA is actually the total amount of power that the utility has to provide. The watts is basically what's doing the work, and what's left over is considered waste. And sometimes they use that uh, power factor as another charge that the utility would charge based on how efficient the facility is. So say, for instance, they might say, well, at a 0.9 power factor, we're not going to charge you anything. But below that, we might charge you a power factor penalty. And there are some things you can do to address that with capacitors and things like that. But for today, I'm just going to about the meters that are monitoring those specific parameters. All right, so why meter? There are lots of different reasons. You can benchmark energy usage. You can verify the savings from projects you've done. You can monitor the quality of the power. But for today, I'm going to focus on primarily the energy codes. Um, and if your particular metering system can meet energy codes, you can also do cost allocation. So a lot of the products in application that I'm presenting today that are addressing the energy codes are the same products that we would use to do cost allocation. We're actually allocate, allocating the energy use back to the, the tenant usage. So energy codes. The first one that I've kind of run into when I started in the metering world is LEED which is leadership for energy and environmental design. Um, and basically when it comes to power monitoring, there are a certain number of rating system that the lead gives you. Um, and the more meters you have on a project, the higher points you get towards that rating and you basically become more of a green building. Um, but there are some requirements that lead kind of started it all for the metering system that you'll see run into the, the you know, ASHRAE 90.1 codes and, and most recently ICC 2021. So the whole intent is to be able to monitor the energy usage within a facility, maybe at, at specific usages, in order to be able to do something about it. The meter itself it can't do anything. Uh, it basically, the action you take based on the information you get from the meter is actually where you get most of the benefit. So if you look at the actual requirements, uh, I know this is kind of small here. Uh, the whole building source needs to be monitored, the entire building. Uh, the meters actually have to be permanently installed, so you can't put something temporary out there. 
it has to be able to store at least three years worth of data and it has to be able to do some reporting back hourly, daily, monthly, and yearly usage that has to be able to come out. Um, the next thing is ASHRAE 90.1. How many have heard of this energy code? So how many heard, have heard of ASHRAE 90.1 2013? And then 16, and then 19, and 2022? So every three years they update this. So uh, I did a little bit of research and I put the link on here uh, where you can actually look at ASHRAE 90.1. Over since 2015, since I started monitoring this, uh, 19 states have, this, have adopted 2013. 2013 is where they started uh, defining ASHRAE, uh, the, the individual categories that you need to monitor. Um, there are nine states that have actually done 2016 and 2019, and this is actually growing. So this was actually as of December 2022. Uh, I put a link on there uh, that where I can get this information from. It's a government link that actually tracks this uh, specific information. Texas uh, has decided to adopt 2013 based on a state and a city uh, level. Uh, and when I see this on projects, sometimes it's at a state project, sometimes it's just decided that that particular owner wants to follow the latest energy codes. And uh, 2013 is the minimum as far as like doing energy uh, classification and sorting. So the requirements for ASHRAE uh, 91 is a specific section within 90.1 is 8-4.3. And uh, I put a link there on the bottom right that you can go to the ASHRAE webs website and do a read-only version of it. And that's where I got a lot of this information. Uh, you don't have to uh, purchase it, but you can actually read through the information and what, what these codes mean. So five different categories that it's requiring. Total, uh, the total building, total HVAC, interior lighting, exterior lighting, and receptacle loads. So each one of those individual categories have to be broken out with the metering system. And there are different ways to do that, and I'll go, and I'll go over that. In 2016, they added the addition of chilled water plant metering, which is actually uh, covered in a different section within ASHRAE 90.1. It's actually under uh, section six, and I'll show that. And then in 2022, which I haven't really found a published version, but I did find like remarks on 2022. And it basically said that if the refrigeration load is more than 10% of the entire building, that needs to be monitored as a separate category as well. So this was the chip water plant monitoring that uh, came out in 2016. It's actually from section 6.4 which is where the building management system is basically located, where they define that. And basically big water-cooled chiller systems, uh, air-cooled systems, those are the kind uh, that they're wanted to monitor the specific electrical usage of those devices. And then they want to do an efficiency calculation. So ideally, the chilled water system would probably go back into the BMS system to do some of these calculations. And I'll show kind of like what happened in 2016, where they required uh, if a building had a digital control system, like a building management system, they want all that data to be fed up through that system and did do the separation of the loads, uh, different categories and things like that. Now, there are products out there like the meters themselves, they can do that as well. They can break out all these different categories between lighting and receptacle and HVAC, and they can feed that information up to BMS or BMS can do it independently. Uh, you just need to make sure that the metering system can break out all these individual loads depending on how it's, it's, it's uh, designed and monitored. So some of the same requirements for the metering system that you saw in LEED, you have to be at least go down to a 15 minute window you have to have at least three years worth of data. You have to be able to report this hourly, daily, monthly, and yearly. And then the data has to be available for the tenant uh, who's going to be either be uh, you know, charged for the electrical usage or the energy codes. And one way to make it available for the tenant is there can be a display on the gear in an electrical room or what would be more beneficial would be you know, having a web page of the devices or a web page showing the individual category of the electrical usage. A lot of BMS systems have that capability. Uh, basically, all of our metering systems have web page enabled devices that all you need is a browser to look up that type of information. 
So there are some exceptions. Uh, any building less than 25,000 square feet does not need to follow SRA 90.1. Uh, in individual tenant space, say in a commercial building, if they're less than 10,000 square feet, they don't need to have the loads broken out. Individual dwelling units, like in your apartment or whatever, they don't need to break out, you know, all of the individual receptacles and lightings, things like that. And uh, in a residential building area with 10,000 square feet uh, of a common area or less, that not, does not to be broken out. But if it is more than 10,000 square feet, it needs to be broken out into those individual categories. And then finally, any hospitals or anything like that, they don't need to follow ASHRAE 90.1 and break out these different categories. So here's an example of what maybe a drawing on a set of plans might look like. On the right-hand side, there might be a note that says, okay, we need to break out these individual categories to follow ASHRAE 90.1. And then they'll put a little, like maybe a number. In this case, we have a number nine. And that number nine is associated with a specific panel. And that specific panel might be a specific load type. And we talked about those five different load types. It might be lighting, it might be receptacle, it might be HVAC. So they put individual notes on there and then uh, our offices, our sales offices would be looking through these plans and I would help them determine what particular meter they need to put in that panel in order to meet all these requirements. And that way you can put together a system that complies with ASHRAE 90.1. Here's another example, same thing that talks about different uh, load types. Uh, but in this instance, we actually have different load types within the same panel. And that's going to require a different type of product to address that. And then down here also, they're all spread out between different load types on different panels. So ASHRAE 90.1 2016 or 2019, now I'm starting to see a new code that's being applied is ICC 2021. How many people have seen this one? So, okay, so you guys are seeing this too. So they almost took ASHRAE 90.1 and added to it. So it's the same category, you know, you got HVAC, you got lighting, you got receptacles, but they added two additional categories to it. They added process load, uh, which could be like kitchen equipment or something like that. And then they have a category that's everything else that's not included in the previous category. So they really want to break down the individual energy uses. Uh, there are some exceptions here. HVAC and water equipment for individual dwellings does not to be, need to be included. And then a few other there that I've noted as well. As far as the system's concerned, they went into a little bit more detail on the system. It was kind of funny to hear in the first one, they talked about the CT accuracy, but nowhere do they talk about the meter accuracy, nor in ASHRAE 90.1 do they talk about the meter accuracy. Uh, most of the meters, especially modern uh, meters today that are found on ANSI C1220 are either 0.5 or 0.2% accurate. Uh, the CTs here they put up, it's 2%, which I think is kind of high. Most of our current sensors are 0.5%. Uh, usually when you're getting into that high 2%, category, maybe there are large split core CTs that may be not quite as accurate, but usually you get into smaller split, uh, CTs, you can get uh, pretty accurate. The data acquisition system, they're actually defining it as a separate system. That could be the BMS system, that could be a device that's collecting all the data, uh, that could be all the individual meters that have at least three years worth of data logging on board that you basically just grab the data and they bring it up. And then finally, a graphical reporting system. Now, they don't really go into exactly what it is, but uh, it could be a BMS system that can create graphs and charts that separates out all the systems. It could be a web page that you can download the data and then bring up Excel and create graphs and charts. So really kind of left over in, into interpretation. One thing I haven't seen with these energy codes is any kind of enforcement. Has anybody seen any enforcement on these energy codes yet? Yeah, so I think we're at the point where we're just trying to get these into the system. Uh, and maybe the enforcement from your guys' perspective is, you know, you're examining to make sure the system was put in correctly and it meets all these requirements. But, you know, going down the road uh, where somebody's coming back and checking these, uh, I think that's kind of still being developed. Here's an example of what you might see for ICC 2021. Similar to ASHRAE 9.1, there might be a table there that says all the individual categories of loads, and they'll put some kind of notes on there, uh, you know, a designation of what load that needs to be. And that way, when we're looking through the plans, we're deciding what particular meter or product that we should put on there. 
All right, so now that we have the energy codes, now I'm gonna talk about, well, how are we gonna address these? What type of products should we use? What kind of design are we looking at in order to address these? So when I was a product manager for meters, I put this little chart together that shows kind of the basic meter down on the bottom, which is a feature set. And as the feature set goes up, you have a higher capabilities of the product, which means the price goes up. For today's discussion, I'm gonna be focused on those bottom two layers. Uh, the bottom layer is basically a single point energy meter, you know, monitoring that kilowatt hour, that power demand, the power factor, and then going one step up is the multi-point meter, where you're actually using that device to monitor a lot of circuits, uh, rather have multiple single point meters, basically one device with multiple sets of CTs running to it. So when it comes to mounting these into the panel, or into the gear, there's two ways. They can either come directly from our factory with the meter installed. Now, when you get it from the factory with the meter installed, it's gonna have the CT wiring correct and it's gonna have the CT orientation correct, right? <laughs> when you do it with the external box there on the right, you know, you're gonna take that box, put it in the field, mount it next to the panel, run a set of CTs over to it, and then there could be a chance that the CTs weren't wired correctly to the meter or that they're oriented incor incorrectly. So the advantages of one versus the other, and, I, and I'll talk about some of that. Here's an example within a switchboard where typically you're monitoring the main power coming into the facility uh, where you would have a meter located within the switchboard, pre-wired, CT orientation correct, and then over on the right we have the, basically what we call an enclosed version of it where we'll put it in a NEMA 12 box, all pre-wired inside, but you still have to run the CTs over to it, get the orientation right, uh, but from the CT shorting block that we're connected to, it's gonna be wired into the plus and minus of the meter as well. And then finally, the multi-point application. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see a switchboard where we have the CTs mounted on rails in the correct orientation. You just run your conductors through those rails directly into the breaker. On the top is where the metering device would be, and then there's a, a display on it that the tenant or whoever could go look at the device. And a lot of times we'll put a communication card in there as well that'll be connected to a building network that the uh, customer or whoever's managing the facility can have access to. Over on the right-hand side is typically a smaller panel board where the uh, current sensors are in a uh, what we call donuts. So they're pre-mounted on a board that you run your conductors in, mount it correctly, doesn't have to be wired. And then that could also be connected to the network as well. So on the right, typically 400 amps or less panel boards. On the left, anywhere up from you know, three, 4,000 to 1,200 amp switchboards and panel boards. <clears throat> And then for external, you know, similar to what we did with the NEMA 12 box, we also put these multi-point meters in NEMA 12 boxes where you would run one, mount one of these next to a distribution board and then run the current sensors, multiple sets of current sensors over to the breakers and then bring that information into the uh, connections on the device and then connect this to the network as well. So on a drawing that we would get, we would review, we would see basically a designation that a CT needs to put on each one of those breakers. And we could do that with a digital metering cabinet on the right, where we would put that multi-point meter in and run multiple sets of CTs over to it, or down on the bottom, basically have it factory installed. So there's two ways to be able to do that and solve the ASHRAE 90.1. In a, say for instance, in a high rise application or a retrofit application, we often recommend putting it in a NEMA 12 box and running multiple sets of current sensors. And on this case, we need, we need to monitor three sets of meters on each floor. Uh, one of these multi-point meters can handle up to eight uh, meters, eight three-pole meters. So in order to basically maximize or, or the usage of these meters, we might put one meter per floor or every other floor, run the current sensors up and run the current sensors down to catch the meters up and below the floors. That way you basically save on material costs for those individual meters. And these current sensors, they're pretty flexible. They can run up to like 200 feet. So lots of distance. And when you're going up and down a floor, that's really not a big distance. Now, the design of the, the building has to be such that this has a common and bus run all the way up through the building and the electrical rooms are right off that bus run. So this kind of work, would work out nice for one of these multi-point applications. So when you're deciding, do I go integral or external? If you don't want callbacks or the, reduce the chance of callbacks, 
internal is obviously the best, but it's also the most expensive because there's additional factory labor that has to be done in order to install these. But if you want lower first costs, then you put the meter in a box and then you put it next to the gear and run the, the, the current sensors over the, to the individual loads. And then from a design perspective, I guess there's a couple ways to handle that as well. Uh, you can either designate an individual panel as all mechanical, all lighting, or all plug, and then designate that on the drawings. And then we would decide, okay, that's going to be one single meter in that panel that's going to be pre-installed and shipped out. Or if it's a brand circuit monitor with all different types of loads in it, we'll put a brand circuit monitor in there, then we'll just use the software of the device to basically separate all, all the individual loads out. All right, so now we have our metering system. We are, we've addressed our energy codes, but now we got to get this information back up to some other system. And we'll do that with communication. And there's two ways of communicating. There's serial communication and network communication. One of the most common serial communication protocols is Modbus RTU. And a lot of times we will daisy chain multiple devices and bring that to a device that would bring it out, a network device. Or they can connect directly via Modbus TCP or very commonly with BMS systems as BACnet IP. So a lot of our meters basically cover most of those protocols. So where you're bringing those Modbus RTU or daisy chaining devices in that would come into a device here, we call it a gateway or some type of processor or storage device that also has that three years worth of data logging capability in it. You would basically come in the bottom of this with the Modbus RTU daisy chaining in and then out would come the network portion of it. And then here's just an example of those different uh, devices daisy chained together going into that gateway device or network directly into the top. And then you have either software connection, BMS connection, or just a straight browser would connect to it. All right, so now that we got all that, let's talk about what a solution might look like. So remember, this is an example I showed before of what, uh, you know, you had a designation of the nine up there, each one of those panels. The way we would address this, we would put together a communication wire diagram for it, designating what type of device we would put in here. So each one of those panels would get a PXM350 or a single point energy meter, and then that information would go back to that, basically that processor or storage device, and then that could be fed to BMS, or you can hit directly to that device itself. Here's another example that I presented earlier with ASHRAE 90.1, where you had different types of loads in the same distribution panel board. That's where we would take individual multi-point meters and enclosures, mount those next to those individual distribution panels, and run multiple sets of CTs over to that, network these into a switch within the building, and then that could be accessed by BMS, or it could be accessed directly by the, by the, uh, the owner. And then from an energy view, we have displays that would show the different categories. Uh, these can also be used for cost allocation because we can create the 20 different categories. Uh, so you saw that you know, IECC 2021 added more than the five. They're now up to seven. So we can go up to 20 with some of our devices and show the individual loads. And this information already bunched together can be fed directly up to uh, the individual categories. And then putting it all together, uh, finally, all these devices that I'm talking about, I have out on the table out there. But here's an example of different ways of capturing energy usage with some of our breakers, some of our multi-point meters, some of our single point meters, all bringing that back to, to something like here. And if you guys want to see what these different products look like, have a touch and feel for them, I have a booth out there or a table out there where you guys can uh, basically see what these devices are. I know that was a lot in a very short period of time. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes. So, yeah, so uh, if you're putting it within a panel board, you can put up to uh, 42 poles, uh, but we actually have the system where you go up to 84. Um, and then if you're doing externally, uh, we can go up to 100 in one system. So 100 individual cir uh, circuits can be monitored. When I say circuit, I mean a CT, current sensor. Yes. Yes, that is new. Uh, the, the question was, is the meter requirement for ICC 2021 new? Yes. Uh, the previous was 2015. 
And the only monitoring there in 2015 was an individual tenant needed to be monitored. And Texas right now is ICC 2015, um, but I am starting to see IC 2021 on the drawings. Certain jurisdictions have adopted it? Yes. The state will be adopting by the end of the year? Okay. It's good to know. So we'll be seeing more of that. To ICC 2021? Uh, I, I had a slide on there. I did have some exceptions at the bottom. Like I think one of the things I covered was individual hot water heaters don't need to be covered, but there, there were two others in there as well. All right, with that, thank you guys for your time. Appreciate it.